Okay, student, today our topic is the middle mediastinum. In the previous portion that we have talked about, the mediastinum is the cavity in the thoracic cavity between the two pleura. When we put the two pleura in the thoracic cavity, the remaining space we call that mediastinum. So today we're going to talk about the middle mediastinum, which is actually having the heart. So let's talk about the outlines we will see today. And uh, here we go the middle mediastinum definition. Middle mediastinum is centrally located in the thoracic cavity. It contains the pericardium, heart, origins of the great vessels, various nerves, and the smaller vessels. If we talk about the general description of the heart, the heart is a hollow, four chambers, muscular organ, shape, conical or pyramidal, and it encloses in the pericardium about 250 to 300 gram and the size of your fist. If you're talking about the external features, it has an apex and the base. Apex is pointing downward and base is pointing posterior superiorly. About its surface, margins, and the sulci. A lot of classification. Some people say that three surface, some say that two surface. So don't be nervous about this classification. We are following the Grace Anatomy, so we will follow the Grace Anatomy classification. So it's got the four surfaces anterior, inferior surface, left and the right pulmonary surface. Left and right pulmonary surface, some people also say that as margin and then the inferior and obtuse margin. Three external sulci. The anterior interventricular posterior interventricular and the coronary. Some people also say that between the two atria, the posterior inter atrial sulci. This place, this tomography is showing very clearly the apex and the base. Some writer also considered the base as the posterior surface. Here we go the anterior surface, diaphragmatic surface, left and the right pulmonary surface. So four surfaces here. As it is also mentioned that the left and the right pulmonary surface also having left and right margin and inferiorly acute margin and here we go the obtuse margin. Talking about the location is present in the thoracic cavity between the lungs in the middle mediastinum. Two over third left to the mid plane and one over third right to the mid plane anteriorly second to the sixth causal cartilage and posteriorly from the fifth to the eighth thoracic vertebrae in its standing position maybe the sixth to the ninth and the literally we are having the lungs and inferiorly we got the diaphragm. Now we talk about the chambers and the valves. Interior of the heart divided into upper left and the right atria, also known as auricle. 
and the lower left and the right ventricle. Between the two atria, we are having the interatrial septum. Between the two ventricles, we are having the interventricular septum. Between the atria and the ventricle, we are having the valves. We call them atrioventricular valves. Between the ventricles and the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, we are having the valve here. We call them semilunar valves. Two atria, two ventricles. So total four chambers and four valves. Now we're going to talk about the right atrium. Right atrium receives the systemic venous blood through superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava is also having its own valve. And from the cardiac muscles, returning the venous blood back through the coronary sinus. It also having its own valve. The right atrium is also having its auricle, as we can see here. The muscles of the atriums, we call them the pectinate muscles left and the right atrium separated from each other through a septum we call that interatrial septum in the neonate there is a foramen here in the septum we call that foramen ovo later on it closed but the remnant is still there we call that fossa ovalis the right atrium can be divided into the two spaces the boundary is the crista terminalis. Posterior to the crista terminalis, including the right auricle, we call that atrium proper, and rest of the portion we call that right atrium sinus. Talking about the triangle of coach. This triangle is having the boundary as here the coronary sinus artifice here you can see we got here the tricuspid valve and here we got the tendon of Dodaro. So clinically it is important landmark for the atrioventricular node. Flow of blood to the right atrium coming in through the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and coronary sinus. Venous blood passing through the right atrium to the right ventricle, and here we go to the tricuspid wall. Now we are talking about the right ventricle. Blood moving from the right atrium to the right ventricle through the tricuspid wall. Tricuspid wall is present between the atrium and the ventricle, also known as interventricular wall. It is present on the right side, so we call that right interventricular valve. Surrounding the tricuspid wall here, we are having the fibrous ring, also known as the annulus ring. Right ventricle, the cavity we can divide it into two parts inflow track and outflow track and between these two tracks the boundary is the supraventricular crust as we can see here the muscles of the ventricles are making a meshwork structure we call that trabeculae cornea. Another kind of muscles, those here showing the finger-like projections, we call them papillary muscles. As the cord tendoning, 
the tendon-like structure from the cusp of the valve are attaching to the muscles so they change into the finger-like structure so papillary muscles are anterior posterior and the septal and here we got the septal marginal trabeculon that is a moderate pain Now talk about the tricuspid complex. What exactly the tricuspid complex is? Tricuspid annulus, tricuspid wall by itself, chordae tendine, and the papillary muscles. These four structures together make the tricuspid complex. The blood is coming from the atrium to the ventricle, passing through the tricuspid valve. And then from here is going out from the heart through the pulmonary trunk by passing through the pulmonary semilunar valve as we can see here these cusp and the valve and this complex when the blood come inside it close and not allow the blood to return back toward the atrium but when it close the return is moving toward the pulmonary trunk let's see the flow of the blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle passing through the tricuspid valve and then moving out to the pulmonary trunk going to the lungs to get the oxygen and here we got the inflow and the outflow of the blood through the atrium to the ventricle. The ventricle is separated from the left side to the septum. This septum we call that interventricular septum. This septum is having the two parts the upper membranous and downward we are having here the muscular part now talking about the left atrium left atrium is receiving the oxygenated blood returning back from the lungs to the pulmonary veins left side to pulmonary and right side also to pulmonary veins left atrium is also forming the base of the heart it is also having a sorical as we can see here the auricle left atrium could also be divided into the left auricle and left atrium sinus here we got the left atrioventricular orifice where we are having the bicuspid wall also known as the mitral wall it is having its two cusp that's why it is known as bicuspid flow of the blood returning from the lungs into the left atrium and from there it is moving to the left ventricle by passing through the bicuspid wall is making the bicuspid complex or the mitral complex now talking about the left ventricle after the blood from the left atrium is coming to the left ventricle by passing through the bicuspid wall or the mitral wall this is also having the two cusp chordae tendine attaching to the papillary muscles endless ring of the valve these structures are making the complex we call that mitral complex we got the cavity divided into two parts as the inflow track 
and the outflow track. At the outflow track, we are having the aortic edifice. And at this place, we are having the aortic semilunar valve. The left ventricle is separated from the right ventricle to the septum. We call that interventricular septum. This septum is formed by the two portions, various membranes. Downward here is the muscular. The flow of the blood from the left atrium, it is going to the left ventricle and from here it is going to the aorta by passing through the aortic semilunar valve. If we compare the valve of the left ventricle as compared to the right one, you can see that the left ventricle wall is three times thicker than the right ventricle because the left ventricle need to pump the blood to the whole body and the right one only need to pump toward the lungs. Let's talk about the superior view of the heart walls and the fibrous ring around it. We got here the pulmonary well and the aortic wall, they are the similar valves. And we got here the bicuspid and the tricuspid wall, they are the atrioventricular valves. The four walls are surrounded by the cardiac fibrous skeleton. The cardiac skeleton. The cardiac skeleton is a collection of dense fibrous connective tissue in the form of the four rings as we can see here around each well these four rings are interconnected in a plane between the atria and the ventricles the four rings of the cardiac skeleton sound the two atrioventricular orifice, the aortic orifice and the opening of the pulmonary trunk. They are the annulus fibers. The interconnecting areas include the right fibrous trigon, which is a thickened area of the connective tissue between the aortic ring and the right interventricular ring. This place. The left fibrous trigon is a thickened area connecting tissue between the aortic ring and the left atrioventricular ring. The cardiac skeleton helps maintain the integrity of the opening is surrounding and provides the point of attachment for the cusp. It also separates the atrial musculature from the ventricular musculature. The atrial myocardium originates from the upper border of the rings whereas the ventricular myocardium originates from the lower border of the rings. The cardiac skeleton also serves as a dense connective tissue partition that electrically isolates the atria from the ventricle. The ventricular bundle which passes through the annulus is a single connection between the two groups of the myocardium. Heart wall. It composed of three layers. The most outer we call that epicardium, muscular one, myocardium, and the most inner one, endocardium. Here we got the epicardium, myocardium, and the endocardium. Myocardium here. The pattern is something like this. The septums of the heart between the two atrium we are having the interatrial septum. Between the two ventricles, we got the interventricular septum. The interventricular septum, we can see, is somehow having two parts, membranous and the muscular. And the left ventricle is covering a lot of space and making this septum as 
the crescent shape. Now talking about the conduction of the heart. It consists of specialized tissue that generate and distribute electrical impulses through the heart. Components. We got sinoatrial node, also known as the heart pacemaker. We got the AV node here, also known as the ventricle node. Between this, we are having the internodal pathway, anterior, posterior, and amenal tract. From the AV node, we are having the AV bundle, also known as the bundle of his, and the band bundle branches, and then we call them propensity fibers, and the terminating, very small, we call the Kent's fibers. It is in the control of the autonomic nervous system as the sympathetic and the parasympathetic portion. See that we got here the sympathetic portion. And the parasympathetic portion to the vagus nerve. Sympathetic through the thoracic spinal nerve and the parasympathetic through the vagus nerve. So we will see a little bit more in detail. Sympathetic innervation is coming from the T1 to T4 and also some contribution from the T5. Stimulation of the sympathetic system increase the heart rate and increase the force of contraction. Parasympathetic innervation to the left and right vagus nerve, which is the number 10 cranial nerve. Stimulation of the parasympathetic system decrease the heart rate, reduces force of contraction and constrict the coronary arteries. The autonomic nervous system conduction, as we can see here from the T1 to T4, sympathetic and through the vagus nerve, the parasympathetic. Under the influence of the sympathetic, increase heart rate and the force of contraction. Under the influence of the parasympathetic, decrease the heart rate and the contraction. With the sensory is also following the same course. Now talking about the musculature. Here we go the pulmonary trunk in the middle mediastinum. We go the ascending aorta and uh, superior Vena cava, and posteriorly we can see here a part of the inferior vena cava, and in the left and the right pulmonary veins, we got here the ECG. In detail, we are having complete lecture on the ECG in the clinical, but today we are just talking about how exactly it is having. So we call the heart sound as the lub, dub, lub, dub. So this portion here, the closure of the mitral and the tricuspid valves is giving the sound as the lub, and the closure of the aortic and the pulmonary semilunar valve is giving the sound as the D. So these are the two hex sound. We can see here at this place the contraction of the ventricle. Known as the systole and relaxation of the ventricles known as diastole. Here we go the blood flow to the heart. We can see here the blood is coming in the heart in the right atrium through the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava and pulmonary sinus and passing through the tricuspid valve and reaching to the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle it is passing through the pulmonary semilunar valve and 
using the pulmonary trunk to reach to the lungs. And then returning from the lungs back to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins and then from the left atrium it is going to the left ventricle by passing through the bicuspid wall or the middle wall. From the left ventricle it is going to the aorta by passing through the aortic semilunar valve and through the aorta it is going to the whole body. So the flow chart is also here can correlate. Here is the pathway of the blood through the heart and the lungs. Let's talk about the coronary circulation. Coronary circulation, the functional blood supply to the heart muscles itself. The left and the right coronary arteries are the first branches of from the ascending aorta. Coronary sinus, it is actually the vein enticing the right atrium. Collateral roots ensure the blood's delivery to the heart even if major vessels are occluded. So let's talk about the arteries first of all. Right coronary artery supplies the blood to the right atrium and the posterior surface of the both ventricles. Branches into the marginal artery and the posterior interventricular artery. Left coronary artery supplies the blood to the left atrium and the left ventricle branches into the anterior interventricular artery and the circumflex artery. All clear. The first two branches coming out from the ascending aorta is the left and the right coronary artery. Left coronary artery we can say anteriorly as the interventricular artery and going back as the circumflex artery. We got here the right coronary artery on the margin is giving the branch as the marginal artery and backward is making the posterior interventricular artery which is also making the anatomosis with the circumflex and also here making the anatomosis with the anterior interventricular artery. Talking about the vein, the coronary sinus, vein that empties into the right atrium, receives deoxygenated blood from the greater cardiac vein, posterior cardiac vein, middle cardiac vein, and the small cardiac vein. Have we got coronary sinus location posteriorly, receiving from the greater cardiac vein, middle cardiac vein, small cardiac vein, and anterior or posterior cardiac vein. Thank you. Referred pain occurs when sensory information comes from the spinal cord from one location but it is interpreted by the central nervous system as coming from another location. So we got here the visual sensory nerve is taking the message to the brain or to the central nervous system at the same place the patient received the diffuse pain in the T1 to T4 dermatomes on the left side. Talking about the pericardium, pericardium, a double wall sac around the heart composed of the superficial fibrous pericardium and the deep two layer serous pericardium. The deep two layers, the outer we call the parietal layer is lining the internal surface of the fibrous pericardium and the inner one is the visceral layer. Visceral layer, also known as the epicardium, line the surface of the heart. They are separated by the fluid filled cavity we call the pericardial cavity. The function of the pericardium protects and anchors the heart, prevent the overfilling of the heart with blood, allow for the heart to work in the relatively friction free environment. Here we go, the pericardium fibrous layer and inside here is the serous layer. Serous layer, the outer one is the parietal, inner one is the visceral. Between these two layers we are having the pericardial cavity. Here we can see. Pericardium is not only just covering the heart, but also the root of the great vessels. Uh, Fibrocytosacs on the heart and the root of the great vessels consist of the two components. 
previous figure counting and the series figure counting. You can see here. Let's talk about the previous figure counting. A tough connective tissue alter layer that defines the boundaries of the middle mediastinum. A cone shaped bag base attached to the central tendon of the diaphragm, left side with the muscle area, but very small. And we got here the ligament, we call that anteriorly, sternopericardial ligament. Okay. And the fibrous pericardium function is limits the cardiac distension, or you can say preventing for overfilling. In this figure, we can see here number three is diaphragm, number four is a sternum. So the two ligaments here are one and two between the pericardium and the sternum. We call that sternopericardial ligament. Between the diaphragm and the pericardium, we call that phrenicopericardial ligament. Phrenic is the word confined to the diaphragm. The serous pericardium, the parietal layer of the serous pericardium is continuous with the visual layer of the serous pericardium around the great vessels, as we can see here. The reflection of the serous pericardium occurs in two locations, one superiorly surrounding the arteries, in which aorta here and the pulmonary trunk. The second posteriorly surrounding the veins, the superior and inferior vena cava. The zone of reflection surrounding the veins is J-shaped and the crudo sac formed within this J posterior to the left atrium is the oblique pericardial sinus this place a passage between the two sides of reflection serous pericardium is the transfer pericardial sinus this sinus lies posterior to the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk anterior to the superior vena cava and superior to the left atrium when the pericardium is open anteriorly during the surgery, a finger is placed in the transverse sinus to separate the arteries from the vein at this place. A hand placed under the apex of the heart and moves superiorly slips into the oblique sinus. This place. Let's apply an innovation. The internal thoracic, pericardiophrenic, musculophrenic, and the inferior phrenic arteries and the thoracic aorta is giving the supply. A is a system of veins and internal thoracic vein and the superior phrenic veins are draining this. Vagus nerve and the sympathetic trunks and the phrenic nerve innovating the pericardium. Clinical condition pericarditis. Inflammation of the pericardium. Here we can see the normal. Here we can see the inflamed pericardium called that pericarditis. Pericardial effusion in which the abnormal accumulation of fluid in the pericardium. This is an example. Constructive pericarditis, abnormal thickening of the pericardial sac. In the abnormal individual, the jugular venous pulse drops on inspiration. In patient with the constructive pericarditis, the reverse happens, and this is called Casimir's sign.
for the surface projections of the heart as the midline two third on the left side one third on the right side posterior to the sternum and the costal cartilage and we can see here from the second intercostal space to the fifth intercostal space the apex at this place projections of the heart valves pulmonary and the aortic valve in the second intercostal place and the mitral and the tricuspid valve in the fifth intercostal space on the left side summary for the valves their location and the components the layers of the heart valve as the epicardium mycardium and endocardium their characteristic and the functions for the valves where we can auscultate 